little bit of a shock compared to what we've had in the last couple of days. Uh, but it's good and warm in here. Turn around and greet somebody and tell them how glad you are to see them this morning. Wish a Merry Christmas to each one of you and your family uh, this Christmas season. I'm glad that there was a baby born in Bethlehem. I'm glad that he was born as a baby, but he lives now as our Savior. And we need to be thankful, we need to praise him, we need to recognize him for who he is. And without him, none of us would be saved. Without him, none of us would have a life change. I'm glad of the life change that happened in my life. If he saved you, he changed you. Can I get an amen? amen? If you really got saved, something changed in your life. I'm thankful this, uh, this Sunday morning. Merry Christmas to everybody. I want to read a few, few verses of Scripture. This is not uh, what I'm going to preach to you, I don't think, but uh, we're going to read some Scripture that has become a tradition in my life to read them every, every Christmas time. Isaiah chapter number 9 and verses 6 and 7 said, For unto us a child is born, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. How many of you believe the Lord can make things happen even in the world we live in now? Luke twenty, uh, Luke two, excuse me, Luke two, verses one through fourteen said, "At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire." This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for this census. Because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them uh, in the inn. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Can you lift your hands and thank God for the Christmas story? I'm going to thank him because the Savior was born. You and I can take advantage of that. How many of you know him to be your wonderful counselor and your Prince of Peace? I thank him today for the privilege of being in his house. We're gonna... How many of you thankful for the that night that the Lord uh, saw fit to bless us? with a child. I appreciate him tonight. Thank him, or today, thank him for the blessing uh, that came to us, made it possible for guys like me with no hope. I was headed down a, a terrible road. He Listen, I was headed for destruction. I was headed for destruction. Had it not been, for a man called Jesus. Had it not been for the old rugged cross. Come on, we got something to praise God for this morning. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? 
Anybody in the house besides me realizes and understands that he saved your life literally? As well as saving your soul for eternity, he saved your life by changing your life. If he hadn't changed my life, there's no telling where I'd be. But because of his saving grace, come on y'all, because of his goodness and his mercy, today I stand here before you, saved by his grace, my name written down in the Lamb's book of life, and I'm on my way to heaven. Be a good place right there, just lift your hands and praise him. I've, I've said it over the years, the greatest gift ever wrapped was in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. I'm so thankful for that gift. I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to, to accept that gift. I want you to pray for just a few minutes with me. Uh, let's bow our heads right here and, and pray for a minute or two or three or four. Ask the Holy Spirit of God to touch us and lead us and guide us. I want to do exactly what he wants me to this morning. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we love you today and we thank you for your goodness and grace. Come on, help me pray, y'all. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for your word, the songs that have been sung, the spirit of God that we feel uh, in this place. And I pray that you'd help me now for the next few minutes, God, that I would be obedient to what you want me to say. I pray that you'd help me to know what you want me to say. Help me, God, to understand when it's time to sit. And God, I'll be careful to praise you. I pray that somebody in this building today, Lord, that it would touch their lives. What I say, not because it's me, but because your spirit anoints us today, God, that somebody in this building uh, that maybe don't know you in a full pardon of sin, maybe they've got something going on in their life that they need help with. I pray, God, that you'd minister to them and touch people's lives. Bless somebody, God, in this building today. And I pray it in Jesus' name, God, that you'd help us now for the next few minutes. Lord, let your word touch us. Let the spirit... Uh, walk the aisles of this church, God, and touch people's lives like only He can. And Father, we'll be careful to give you praise, glory, and honor for everything that you do. In Jesus' wonderful name we ask. And everybody in the house said amen. Amen again. I, I want to I talk for just a few minutes about your faith uh, this morning, the faith that you have working on the inside of you. How many of you understand I said not long ago when I was preaching here, I said that faith is an action word, it's active. Faith does something. Faith got you saved. It was active the night or the day that you got saved. When the Lord came into your heart, your faith had to act. It had to move you to a place of repentance. It had to move you to a mindset that said, I need forgiveness for my sins. It had to move you to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and allow Him to be Lord of your life. Faith is a movement. Faith is a movement. It moves you. And it will move you after you get saved. It will move you to want to live right. Faith will move you to change your actions. Come on here everybody. I, I said a while ago when you got saved something changed in you. And when you got saved, your faith caused things to happen in your life that people around you said never would happen. They said, I never would quit this, and I never would quit that, and I'd never be able to do this, and I'd never be able to do that. Well, I want to tell you something. Faith caused me to be able to change their minds because God did something in my life that changed me. Turn around and tell your neighbor, say, faith will make you quit talking ugly. Say amen. Faith, faith will change you. Faith will change you where you, you won't want to do it. Come on. It's old-fashioned, I know, but I'm just going to preach what I feel in my heart. Faith will make you start loving things you hated and hating things you love. If God saves you, it'll change where you go. It'll change how you talk. It'll change how you think. Faith is active in a child of God today. Amen. Glory to God. The devil don't want it heard, but I'm going to tell you something. Faith changes everything. Amen. Changes how you live. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, y'all. Faith is an action word. And James said, faith 
without works is dead. How many of you know James talks real plain sometimes? Come on, say amen. It's, it's widely accepted and acknowledged among most folks that I've talked to and even people that I've read after. James writes a strong word. All the time it seems, now this is just personal here, but it seems like when I read James, he's getting in my business. Seems like he wants to talk about me when I start reading after him. Next thing you know, he challenges you. You start reading James and he gets in the business and then he challenges you. I've also noticed in the book of James, you may have never noticed it, but it stuck out to me. He asked a lot of questions in the book of James. James 2 and 14. He said, what good is it? Question. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? What a question. You say you got faith, but your actions don't show it. Come on, y'all. Help me praise the Lord for just a minute about what He changed in you. I'm excited about the Word today because faith changes what's going on in your life. Even after you say faith is what it takes to change your circumstances, to believe that God's still able to change things. Because you got faith. Raise your hands, everybody, and give God some good praise. Faith changes things. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? James 2 and 14 in Amplified. I thought it was pretty interesting, the language it uses in the Amplified. It said, what is the benefit, my fellow believers, if someone claims to have faith but has no good works as evidence. Can that kind of faith save him? No, a mere claim of faith is not sufficient. Genuine faith produces good works. In the verse here, and for the sake of my sermon this morning, James asks a question that should bring us to a place of analysis. We ought to analyze what's going on in our Christian life. In our lives this morning, consistent of a daily routine in life, is our faith shown or illustrated by our actions? I had to take inventory this morning, Thomas. I had to stop and think. Am I more apt to pray or am I more apt to complain? Is it more likely that when I'm in everyday life, going through the motions, going through everyday life, is it more likely for me to grumble about how things aren't going than to have faith to change how I'm thinking? Come on, y'all. It got quiet. I felt it. it just a... What, what, what are you, let's ask a question. What are you more likely to do, lady? What, what is it you're more likely to do, Deborah? James, ask us a question. What, what good's your faith if it ain't doing something? If it's just, you just say, I got faith, but there ain't nothing happening in your life to prove you got faith. So what, what happens is, and, and, and it's a shame. I, I got ashamed of myself this morning in my study. I, I tried to study last night. I tried to study a little Friday night, and this morning it seemed like I got ashamed when I started seriously considering what's more likely to happen when things ain't going my way. Am I more likely to grumble, complain, or am I more likely to let my faith change my situation? Y'all help me pray. In our lives, daily life, is our faith shown or illustrated by our actions? It's a fair question. It's an honest question. What kind of faith do we have? What does faith look like at your house? For the sake of, listen, has faith changed things at your house? Has faith changed the way things go in your house? Or is it the same old six and seven? Give God praise because how He's changed things in your house. Somebody said, oh, Ricky's carried away. Well, I'll tell you something. When it really changes, it'll get you carried away. When your faith has proven to you that something really happened, it'll make you excited like old Ricky. When you've been in bondage like he's been in bondage and you get free, it'll make you holler, Woo! It will. It'll make you get excited when you've been in the, when you've been in the gutter and God brings you out because you had faith. It'll make you shout and say, Glory to God. Woo! Well, 
make you happy. What's it look like? What's your faith look like at your house? And, and, and listen, we're, we're, let's be honest with one another. We own this roller coaster, ain't we? We own these hills, we own these valleys, we own these hills, we own these valleys, we up and down. One day you talk to us and we're at the foot of the cross and praying every prayer of faith you ever heard in your whole life. And the next day you talk to us, we're in a... That's the truth. And James said, you say you got faith, what's going on to prove it? Oh, I'm convicted. I'm in trouble this morning. It got serious in my office. What's it look like? When things ain't going, when my wife's had a bad day, am I helping her or am I contributing to her bad day? It ain't that funny. You understand what I'm saying? Am I more apt if... if, 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 if <laughs> I need to hush right there. I'm just going to stop. Have you got faith? Is your faith changing things? Is your faith doing something good for you? Or is your faith just words? Just words. James said, if it ain't got no action with it, it ain't worth a hoot. That's what he said. He follows up with more questions. He keeps asking questions, by the way. He don't stop. He keeps asking questions. He said, what good is it if somebody ain't got no clothes on, they ain't got no food? What good is it say you got faith, but you tell them when they ain't got no food, no clothes? I hope you get some food. I hope you get some clothes if a brother or sister's poorly clad. If they lack food for each day and one says to them, goodbye, I hope you stay warm and well fed without helping them. What good is that? What good is that? I told you all about an experience I had. Me and Beverly was walking the streets one day and there's this guy sitting there, had his cup held out. My smart aleck attitude said, I ought to get him a job is what he ought to do. quarter of a mile down the road, the Holy Ghost convicted me. I had to turn around and go back and give him some money. Faith will change you. Come on, y'all. Faith, faith, will, faith will move you. It, listen, hey, I'll tell you something. If you ever been without, you'll have a mind change because your faith says you ought to help somebody instead of running them down. I had a situation happen to me. Somebody done me wrong. Somebody done me wrong. Me and my wife's talking about it the other day. Somebody done wrong, done me wrong. It was personal. It was, it was a broad view, but it was a personal view. They done me wrong. Me and my wife was talking about it. Said, she said, every time I think about it, it makes me sick to my stomach. I said, me too. But I helped. Listen. My faith wanted to be mad. I mean, no, it didn't. <laughs> My flesh wanted to be mad. But my faith made me help them. Come on. To go ahead and help them when your flesh wants to lash out. And I told Beverly this. I said, see, the thing about it is I remember when I was in a mess and people helped me. Amen. Come on, everybody. Ain't you... Ain't you glad some people's got faith not just in words, but you see their faith by their actions? Can somebody praise the Lord because you've seen faith in operation? He's still on the subject of faith, James is. There's more to it than simply telling someone who's hungry and naked to go eat. Go get, go get you some clothes and put them on. It requires faith in action to help them. Faith without action has no power. It's inoperative. It's dead. James was a preacher with a vocabulary. One writer said he had a vocabulary of a prophet. The authority and force of his words very closely resembled the method and the language of Jesus, his half-brother, in his ministry. Thirty times in five chapters in the book of James, he uses nature to illustrate the truth, which also mirrors the ministry of Jesus. We all know that James wrote about the tongue. Anybody want me to preach on the tongue today? He warned, he warned believers. He, listen, he warned church people about showing favoritism. 
The book of James is the earliest of the Christian letters and it's addressed to the 12 tribes who were scattered abroad that was the catalyst for the worldwide church at that time. James 1, 1 and 2. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ of the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. How many of you happy when you fall into a temptation? Faith ought to make us be able to see it for what it is. And I don't do that. Do y'all? I'm waiting. I don't. I, 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 Divers test don't make me happy. So I've got work to do. How many of you got work to do? Come on, y'all. Smile at Pastor. We got work to do. The trouble or the test produces endurance. If we need wisdom, James said, ask for it. Does any man like wisdom? Another question. Let him ask for it. Ask in faith without doubt and without hesitation. When we ask God for something in prayer, who is limitlessly capable. How many of you believe he is? If we allow doubt or hesitation to be involved, it means we're in danger of being double-minded, James said, or unstable. When that happens, he plainly states that we will not receive. He teaches that endurance is what will result in a crown of life. Some of our double-mindedness comes as a result of the temptations in our life when we don't react well with our faith. James writes that God's not our tempter. We're tempted as we enable temptation by yielding to our own lust. When we do that, it's sin. And sin will kill you. How many of you, how many of you have been tempted this week? I don't, want to, I don't want to know your details, what you were tempted with, what you were tested with. But when you're tempted... Man is drawn away by his own lust. When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Faith, come on y'all, faith can help you to rise above the temptation. Somebody said, I can't quit. That is a lie. Somebody said, I can't stop. That is not true. You can stop. You don't want to stop. Lust is inviting. Lust looks good. It's the pride of life, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It makes you want it. And if you ain't got faith, it's hard to resist. It is. Because your eyes... <laughs> will tell you that it's good. But your faith needs to tell you that you need to shy away from it. Somebody help me praise the Lord. How many, how many of you believe what the Scripture said about the list of people that ain't going to make it to heaven and the requirements to make it to heaven? Now I'm not, I ain't got time to go into all of them. I didn't write them down. But there's a list of people that ain't going to make it in. And there's a list of requirements to make it. Brad Heyman made a statement. His daddy, he quoted his daddy, and I'll never forget it. It has stuck with me. He said, it's going to take more to get you out of your shoes when the rapture takes place than most people think. How many of you want to go to heaven? I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I, but my faith has got to help me to live in such a way that proves that I want to go to heaven. So let us thank God that he gives good and perfect gifts. Somebody lift your hand and thank God for salvation today. Come on. Sin will kill you, but thank God he's given us the ability to resist. And then the half-brother Jesus James, he tells us, be swift to hear and slow to speak. And he says, don't only to be hearers, but be doers of the word. Don't forget to look at yourself, he said, and take Take inventory and change what needs to be changed. James 1 and 26 said, If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. You know, it's amazing, according to James, that we can listen. This is James. This ain't Kate's. This is God speaking through James by the Holy Ghost. And James said, It's amazing 
that we can control horses and ships real easy with a rudder or a bridle, yet we can't or won't extinguish the fire starter that's in our mouth. Guilty. How many of you know? I need to hush. I've talked about my mouth too much already. James 3 and 6 through 8 said the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. We have a habit. Here you go. I'm, I'm getting ready to close. Y'all can ease up a little bit. We have a habit, Brother Dan, of blessing God and cursing men with the same tongue. We got double-minded. Y'all ever heard the old Indian on TV say to speak with forked tongue? We're blessing God with one side of our mouth and we're cursing somebody or talking bad about them. Maybe not cursing them, but talking bad about them out of the other side. Using the same tongue. But I want to tell you something. When you got faith involved, that same tongue can cause things to happen that are amazing. When you ask with faith, it changes things. Faith has works that changes things. I had to stop, and Jason, I had to stop and take inventory of myself. How, in my daily life, and I'm not talking about when I'm at church. Y'all see me up here, but I'm talking about when I'm at home, y'all ain't around. Is my faith showing up? Is my faith, is my faith such that it changes things? around me or am I adding to the trouble faith it's active it causes things to happen we ask and we receive not because we ask amiss would you stand with me everybody My last scripture today, James 4 and 17, said, Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. It is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. Is there anybody in the house this morning? Anybody in the house this morning that your faith needs to be more active? That your faith needs to produce. That's, that's really what James is saying. Faith is an action word. It produces. Anybody in the building that's raised your hand, women, and nobody looking around, just by your head, and no, nobody looking around. If, if, you, if you'd say to, to me this morning, my faith needs to produce some actions different from what it's producing, just slip your hand up. I think we all have a consensus in the building. We all feel the same way. We need more faith in it to be more active. Faith will help you change. Faith will help you change. Anybody in this building say, Preacher, I need, I need some help. I need some more faith. I need to get things changed. I need my faith to be more active. If you need to pray this morning, this altar is open for you to come and exercise your faith, to put your faith into action. That'll be, a, that'll be a, an act. By coming to the altar, be an act. You're acting on your faith. Do you need to pray this morning? Anybody? Anybody you need to pray? Thank you, Lord, for those that are coming. Thank you, Lord, for that. <laughs> Lift your hands, church. Thank God. I want, us to, I want us to all pray. Come on. If you're still standing at the pew, I want you to stretch your hands this way. Let's pray and ask God to give us faith that's got action with it, that changes things. In Jesus' name, Father, touch.
right now, God, I pray that you touch. In Jesus' name.